The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesús le dijo, ¿Por qué me llamas bueno? Ninguno hay bueno, sino solo uno, Dios. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, Honor your father and mother. El entonces respondiendo le dijo, Maestro, todo esto lo he guardado desde mi juventud. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Pero él, afligido por esta palabra, se fue triste porque tenía muchas posesiones. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Los discípulos se asombraron de sus palabras, pero Jesús respondiendo volvió a decirles, Hijos, cuán difícil les es entrar en el reino de Dios a los que confían en las respuestas. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Ellos se asombraban aún más, diciendo entre sí, ¿Quién, pues, podrá ser salvo? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Entonces, Jesús, mirándolos, dijo, Para los hombres es imposible, mas para Dios no, porque todas las cosas son posibles para Dios. Entonces, Pedro comenzó a decirle, He aquí, nosotros lo hemos dejado todo, y te hemos seguido. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields, for my sake and for the sake of the good news. Que no reciba cien veces más ahora en ese tiempo. Casas, hermanos, hermanas, madres, hijos y tierras, con persecuciones. Y en el siglo venidero la vida. Open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your wisdom. Open our hearts so that we may know your love and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thirteen years ago, my family and I moved in with my mother in Brevard. We had been living in a large house, and we did a lot of getting rid of, selling, and giving away things before we moved. We thought we'd narrow down our things to what we liked best what meant the most to us, and what we would really need when we moved into our own place again. We ended up staying with my mother much longer than intended. The whole time, boxes of our stuff were stored in her basement and garage. This past summer, when my daughter and I finally moved into our own place, I was dismayed at how much stuff we had. There was a lot we no longer wanted or needed or even knew we had, like four sets of silverware. <laughs> Moving has made it shockingly clear to me that stuff takes a lot of my time and energy and attention. I fear that I've let the consumerist society that we live in affect me more than I would like. Perhaps, like me, you can at least somewhat identify with the rich man in our gospel reading for today. He asks Jesus 
a seemingly simple question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The fact that the man runs to Jesus and kneels before him indicates that he is sincere. Jesus references the commandments about being in relationship with others, and the man answers that he has kept all of these since he was young. Jesus looks at the man and loves him. Then Jesus tells him the hard truth. Jesus, knowing that this man is rich and attached to his wealth, tells him how to sell what he tells him to sell what he owns, give the money to the poor, and follow him. The man is shocked and leaves grieving, knowing that he has many possessions that he isn't willing to part with. It's not the possessions themselves that keep the man from doing what Jesus suggests. It's that the man is holding on too tightly to them. Sadly, this is the end of the encounter between this man and Jesus. The man simply walks away, and the healing that Jesus is offering him, the man doesn't realize. But the man is stuck knowing that he doesn't want to do what Jesus is telling him to. Jesus goes on to use this situation to instruct his disciples. He tells them that it would be easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples are greatly confused. At that time, wealth was seen as a blessing from God, and wealthy people were often seen as having a special relationship with God. But Jesus is contradicting that logic. The disciples ask, then who can be saved? Jesus reminds them that with God, all things are possible. Peter replies, we left everything to follow you. Maybe Peter wants to make sure Jesus sees that he and the disciples are better than the rich man who just left. Jesus replies that everyone who leaves behind things that matter to follow him will be rewarded many times over in this life and with eternal life, but also that those who follow him will face difficulties in this life. Our reading concludes with Jesus saying, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. This reading may come across as rather judgmental to our ears. We might find ourselves feeling like we can't possibly do what God is asking of us. We might be tempted to just walk away in shock and grief like the rich man. We may find ourselves feeling like the disciples, perplexed, at Jesus' words about wealth being a barrier to the kingdom of God. Or perhaps we can identify with wanting God to see how we are doing a better job than others at living as God wants us to. We may have questions or fears about the difficulties we face in life. Yes, this text may initially sound harsh to us, but it can help to go back to the word love. Jesus looks at the rich man with love. He sees the man as he is, and he loves him. The man doesn't have to do anything. Jesus simply loves him. And because Jesus loves the man, he is inviting him, all may flourish, to join in God's healing work in the world. This was hard for the rich man to hear, and it can be hard for us to hear, too. We want to have things that help us feel secure and in control. We want to spend our time doing what we want to do. 
We want to follow God in ways that are convenient and comfortable and safe for us. But despite all of our fears and resistance, Jesus loves us and invites us to a new, fuller way of life, one that is healing for all. As you heard in the ministry moment today, uh, it is Thank Offering Sunday. When we hear about the ministry that Welka, or women of the ELCA, do. Some of the ministries that women here at Grace are involved in are the quilting ministry and the prayer shawl ministry. You can see samples of their work around the sanctuary today. We meet here at Grace every Tuesday. The quilts that the women at Grace make are given both locally to organizations like Interfaith Assistance Ministry and globally through Lutheran World Relief. And their special ministry yearly project is to make personalized quilts for the graduating seniors at Grace. By the end of this year, the quilters will have come close to completing 200 quilts. There are also many women in our church who faithfully knit or crochet prayer shawls. All prayer shawls, when completed, are prayed over and brought to the church where they are available for anyone to give to a family member, friend, or neighbor who is sick or who might be struggling in some way. There are shawls ready and waiting to provide comfort and hope. Just ask if you know someone who needs one. In addition to quilting and prayer shawl groups, Welka groups at Grace also meet regularly for fellowship, learning, Bible study, and service projects, like making school kits for Lutheran World Relief and prayer cards that are distributed locally at the Eucharist services that Pastor Christina offers at local senior communities and through Meals on Wheels. Currently, there are two active circles at Grace, Sarah Circle and Naomi Circle that meet monthly. Grace Women are a part of the Smoky Mountain Conference an area that includes 11 ELCA churches in northwestern North Carolina, which meet together a few times a year. Every three years, there's a churchwide welcome gathering with women from all over the country getting together. The special envelope available today for the welcome thank offering supports the ongoing ministries of churchwide Welka, which include online and printed communications, justice and advocacy work, training and development for leaders, and scholarships and ministry grants. On the bulletin board in the fellowship hall, you can find information about upcoming Grace Women's events and their monthly newsletter. In the newsletter, you'll find Welka's purpose statement, which guides them in their life and ministry together. This is their statement. As a community of women created in the image of God, called to discipleship in Jesus Christ, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we commit ourselves to grow in faith, affirm our gifts, support one another in our callings, engage in ministry and action, and promote healing and wholeness in the church, the society, and the world. This statement sums up well what it means to be a Christian faith community, a group of people who were created in the image of God, who are called to follow Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit, who commit to grow in faith to affirm their gifts and the gifts of others, to actively engage in ministry, and to promote healing and wholeness in the church and the world. This idea of healing and wholeness in the last line of Welka's purpose statement is also found in the Hebrew phrase, tikkun olam, which means world repair or to heal the world. 
The phrase comes from ancient rabbinical teachings that direct people of faith to participate with God in repairing or healing the world through acts of kindness and social justice. This world repair takes place in countless ways, through Welka, through other ministry teams at Grace, through other faith communities, through nonprofits and government organizations. The last two and a half weeks have been hard for us as a community and for us as individuals. Hurricane Helene has caused much damage destruction, worry, trauma, and grief. In these last two and a half weeks, we've seen this healing and world repair taking place before our very eyes. We've seen people helping each other in tangible and practical ways, in listening to each other's stories, in hugs and prayers. We've received such acts of healing, and we've offered them to others. In these days and weeks of challenge and beyond, may we know that God loves us and is with us. May we see God's healing and repairing work in the world.